Uh, next up, we're going to have uh, Caleb Moffin from the Center for Political Innovation. Uh, Caleb has been a longtime U.S. Friends supporter. Um, we are honored that he is able to be with us tonight. So, again, I will welcome Caleb. Thank you. Thank you. All of us should take the opportunity now to stretch a little bit, right? Just stand up and stretch, right? Because the evening is young, and we've got plenty to discuss. I'm opening a can of unnamed diet beverage. <laughs> My throat will be leaving, I'm sure. It's an honor to speak on a panel with Dr. Grover for our, well, Dr. Grover for his research has been a game changer in the conversation about the 20th century and what's been happening and changing the way people talk about these things. People in Russia are studying grover fir. People in China are studying grover fir. Uh, people in the African continent are studying grover fir. All over the world, people are reading that book, uh, at Kruzchev Line, because that's such an important thing. And I want to also mention that I, I had the honor years ago to do political work with people at Montclair State University who were working with grover fir. Uh, and I got to see the grover fir place have a mentoring role to young activists and He's just been a, a really kind and loving person. He's a father and a grandfather. I always wish Grover for a happy 80th birthday. Thank you. Yeah. Dan, how many books have you written? Uh, eight. Uh, eight. Uh, eight. Only eight? Only eight. Every one of the books that Dan has written is, is amazing, oh, right? Amazing. I have had the honor. I've read the Cancel Culture book. I've read his book on Nicaragua. Anti-imperialism flows through every page of Dan Cavallo's writing. So I am honored to be here with Dan. Uh, we were election observers together recently yes. in Russia. He went into the territory, the right. new republics yep. that have been liberated from the NATO fascist regime. Uh, it's really an honor to be here with you, and I'm very honored. Thank you. Thank you. And of, of course, I have to be giving a shout out to a really, really great friend of the Center for Political Innovation who's here, Jyoti Brar. Yeah. Uh, and Jyoti Brar is doing amazing work uh, with the World Anti-Imperialist Platform. And also we have here people from what has got to be the strongest nation on the face of the earth, which is Korea. Our Korean comrades are here. This is a country that has been divided by the imperialists. Divided by the by their presence. Uh, this is really, you know, this is a small gathering, but this is a powerhouse. There's energy in this room. People in this room are going to make a difference in the future of this country. I also want to mention, uh, and, you know, the Party of Communists, I've been engaging with you all for a long time, U.S. friends of the Soviet people, and you guys have always been standing up and demanding that the disgraceful organization that claims to be the Communist Party of the United States drop the false advertising. And that is something that absolutely needs to be done. Because the Communist Party of the United States is anything but that. You guys are what they should be. And I'm honored to be here. And I also want to mention that in the age of identity politics, you booked a panel tonight with uh, Dan Kavalik and Grover Fur and myself. We're three white guys. Who does that anymore? <laughs> Who does that, right? You know, I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy. But I, I joke, of course. But it's really, really an honor to be here tonight. So I wanted to begin my remarks by reading a piece of poetry. He wanders like a shadow from door to door through the world, holding in his hand the oak panduri and playing it tenderly. In the sounds so full of dreams and the rays of the sun, you can hear pure truth and divine love. Many stony, frozen hearts started beating then, and many blinded, frozen minds turned to light again. But instead of gratitude for the sounds of sweet as love, the mob brought to the anchorite the cup full of poison. The cup is full of poison, and they told him, drink it and be damned to fulfill your destiny. We do not need your truth, nor your heavenly voice. Now that's a beautiful piece of poetry that was written in 1895 by a teenage revolutionary activist. 
And that teenage revolutionary activist who was living in the nation of Georgia that was at that point part of the Russian Empire he became known to the world as Joseph Stalin. And he wrote this beautiful piece of poetry when he was just a young man. And it's a beautiful piece of poetry because it speaks to something that we have all experienced, which is that we know something that is true and the world around us won't acknowledge it. And we know this reality. We, can't, we know it's be true. But the people around us don't want to hear it. They don't want to acknowledge the truth. And it drives us crazy. And you can bet that young Stalin experienced that. And that's what he was writing about in this beautiful piece of poetry. And it's something that all of us that get into the revolutionary movement can relate to. Because it gets frustrated. Talk to your family member. Talk to your classmates. Talk to your coworkers, And you tell them the truth. And they just don't want to hear it. They can't refute what you're saying. They don't have facts to counter what you're saying. But they just can't acknowledge the reality that you are pointing at. Well, somebody who was a good friend of mine, he once told me that if you don't know that something's true, you can't prove it, you're not sure of it, don't say it. But if you know that something's true, if you absolutely know that something is true, then never be afraid to scream it from out. If you know something is absolutely true, even if the whole world is against you, scream it from the heaven and say it to be the truth. And if that is a good rule to live by, say anything that you don't know. You don't know it to be true, don't say it. But if you know it to be true, don't be afraid to scream it from the heaven. And it's that mindset that brought me to this moment. Because I was a young man and I was growing up in a little town in Ohio and I was learning about socialism and communism. Everybody I knew told me that communism had never worked anywhere. It's just a big failure, a big disaster. Everywhere that socialism has ever been tried, it failed. But I liked the idea of socialism. My mother went on strike as a librarian. I walked the picket lines with her. I was to read Guthrie music, learned about how communists had built the labor movement. And so I was interested in communism. But I've been told that everywhere communism had ever been tried, it had just completely failed. That would have been starving the people. So I was looking into different ideas about communism, and I heard about Trotsky. And I thought, okay, well, this guy's a guy that Stalin filled. So maybe this guy can point me towards some kind of communism that won't be like the band. So I went to the public library, and they had a book by Leon Trotsky with a great name that was called Revolution Betrayed. And I thought, this is the book that's going to tell me all about why the Soviet Union got it wrong, but maybe there's another way to get it right. And I opened Revolution Betrayed, Chapter one of Revolution the Trade is called What Has Been Achieved? And it's nothing but economic statistics. And I started reading this about how the Soviet Union had more steel and was producing more steel than any other country in the world. How the Soviet Union produced more tractors than any other country in the world. How they were electrifying the country at a rapid rate. How they built the world's largest power plants, the world's largest steel mills, the world's largest oil industry. How this whole country was industrializing rapidly. And I read this, and I thought, well, this can't be true. can't be true. Because everybody knows that everywhere communism had ever been tried, everyone was starving and poor and miserable. So I went to the library once again, and I got this old, archaic piece of ancient technology called an encyclopedia. They used to have the world. I got the encyclopedia off the wall, and I read, turned to the part about the Soviet Union. And I read the part about the economy. And I, I read in a small paragraph, we said the Soviet Union actually did have very big achievements, industrializing the country, raising people out of poverty. Uh, elect and I thought, what? They're saying it's true. And I looked in other books and I discovered that what I had been told about the Soviet Union, what I had been told about communism was a lie. It was a big, fat lie. I call it the myth of the 20th century. And political conversation in the United States is predicated on this good lie. It comes up in every debate. When Bernie Sanders is running for president, he says, I think that everyone should have free health care. That's what I think. Boxing said, well, they tried that in the Soviet Union and everyone just starved and died and was miserable, so you can't do that. Oh, good point. Uh, maybe I'll give up. I mean, it's like that's, that's a political debate in the United States. Debate is predicated on something that is not fruit, which is that somehow socialism hasn't been successful. Well, it was socialism that invented space travel. 
It was socialism that defeated the Nazis in the Second World War. It was socialism that took China from being one of the poorest countries in the world from the second largest economies in the world. It was socialism that's caused the economic miracle in Vietnam. It's socialism that made Cuba the country that had the higher life expectancy than any other country in Latin America. And the idea that socialism just doesn't work, it just failed, this is a lie. And it is the lie of the 20th century. And everybody knows that it's not true, but they can't acknowledge it. They refuse to acknowledge it because of the consequences. And as I was told, and as I've tried to live by, that don't say something if you don't know it to be true, if you're not sure of it, but if you do know that something's true, don't be afraid to scream it from the heavens. Based on that, I have felt an obligation my entire life to stand up to this big lie. Because if this big lie didn't exist, our road to the United States wouldn't be crumbled. If this big lie didn't exist, we would be having health care benefits in this country. If this lie didn't exist, they wouldn't be able to sell us on all their ugly wars and bomb and destroy countries. This lie is so sensible to American imperialism. It is such a foundational myth for the crimes of the ultra-rich against working people that we have to oppose. It. And I have never, I got to tell you, I have never had any tolerance or any time for people that approach this question with, you know, with, uh, you know, we've all seen it, right? The Trotskyites, the anarchists, there's a million forms of fake leftists, right? Uh, and they come along and someone says, well, didn't communism kill a hundred bajillion million people? And they say, well, that's true, but anyone who starts the conversation with, well, that's true, but has already lost the argument. If you don't take on the myth of the 20th century, if you don't stand up for history, you don't stand up for facts, you've already lost. And that's what I admire the U.S. friends of the Soviet people for doing. This, this whole organization has been dedicated to challenge and lead lies. You know, if someone says, you know, well, Stalin killed 100 gajillion billion people. Stalin killed 300 million people. Stalin killed 5 billion people. You can destroy that with one word. How? How? Tell me how. Oh, how did he kill these people? Just, just how? And they'll say, well, uh, well, there were there were uh, th th there were these things called gulags. It's like there were more people. There's more people in American prisons right now than were in the gulags. The gulags didn't have gas chambers in them. They weren't Nazi concentration camps. Most people who went to gulag got out. Uh, yeah, there was great terror. It was a bad time. A lot of people were turning their neighbor then. It was not a good time. But the idea that that is responsible for these huge numbers, that's, that's not the day. And then they say, well, there was a famine. There was a famine. Okay, well, well Stalin was responsible for this famine. And that's where these big numbers come. Think about this thing. Now, now, before Stalin came along, or the Soviet Union, they didn't have tractors on the Soviet countryside. They didn't have electrification in the Soviet countryside. They were using a horse-drawn plow. And Stalin is the guy who brought tractors to the countryside. Stalin's the guy who brought, you know, electricity to the collective farm system. Stalin's the guy who built the Soviet food and agricultural system. So saying that Stalin killed all these people with famine, that's a little bit like saying that a doctor who cured someone of cancer is responsible for the cancer. Stalin's the guy who cured the famine. Stalin didn't create the famine. This is a nonsense argument. But people repeat it. And then what else do we hear? And this is another one. Well, Stalin engaged in ethnic cleansing. You heard this one? He engaged in ethnic cleansing. It was forced deportation. Well, World War II was a pretty awful event. 27 million people died in that war. 27 million and during that war, people were moved around on the basis of their nationality. That is true. And it was that policy that saved millions of Soviet Jews from the Nazi gas chamber. Because when the Nazis were coming, they were moved on the basis of their nationality away from the front lines because they knew the Nazis would kill them. And moving people around on the basis of their nationality is a, not a good thing, obviously. But in the context of a war, when 27 million people are dying, when the whole country is in a state of lockdown fighting for their lives, that's not a genocide. That's not ethnic cleansing. That's being strategic and trying to win a war. You can't equate them. I've said before that you don't know something, you shouldn't say it. But if you do know something, 
And you absolutely know it to be true. Don't be afraid to swim it from the heaven, from the heaven. Anyone who tries to tell you that Stalin was like Hitler or killed as many people as Hitler or killed more than anybody Hitler, that's bullshit. That's bullshit, and we shouldn't be afraid to say it. And one thing that I think we should be aware of is that Stalin directly benefited all of us. All of us have had better lives because of Stalin. We're on the other side of the planet in a completely different country. But, you know, what was the greatest strike wave in American history? Anyone know? No, the greatest strike wave in American history was in 1877. Railroad workers went on strike all over the country. No worker, no strike in American history has ever been as big as 1877. And you know what we won, what we got as a result of the 1877 railroad workers' strike? Nothing. We got the National Armory system so that they could better shoot down workers when they were on threat. We won absolutely nothing. There was a much smaller strike wave in 1934 when the dock workers shut down San Francisco, when the Teamsters shut down Minneapolis, when the auto bike workers shut down Toledo, Ohio, and when the workers of South Carolina went out and organized to demand better rights with farm workers. And the summer of 1934, nowhere near as big as 1877, that got us Social Security. That got us the, uh, the Wagner Act of legalizing labor unions. Uh, that laid the basis for the Fair Labor Standards Act. That got us the Work Progress Administration. Roosevelt started hiring, unemployed people by the millions. Why? What was different between 1877 and 1934? In 1877, there was the Soviet Union. And in 1934, the Soviet Union existed and it was booming while the rest of the planet was having a Great Depression. And the bosses got scared and they said, you better give these people some jobs. We better give them some Social Security. We better give them some benefits. So if anyone in your family has ever collected Social Security, if you've ever had a member of your family who got a, a decent paycheck you were union, you can, you can thank Stalin and the Soviet Union for that. Yeah. Yeah. Furthermore, I had this three teacher in high school, and he, he enjoyed going into the archives of my little town, Orville, Ohio, and going into the town newspaper and digging up old news items from the history of my town. And one news item he gave and it was from 1951, I believe, in my little town in Ohio. It was a news article, and the headline was, Take That, Uncle Joe. Take That, Uncle Joe. And it had a picture of an African-American family. And it was a news item from a little, my little town in Ohio. And it began with a quote from Joseph Stalin about how America is a racist country. It oppresses black people. And it said, clearly, Stalin doesn't know what he's talking about because we just allowed a black family to buy a house. Clearly, Stalin is wrong. Take that, Uncle Joe. And, uh, uh. and that article was just one example of the fact that the civil rights movement came from Stalin. If it wasn't for the fact that when Emmett Till was brutally murdered, lynched for whistling at a white woman, the Soviet Union took the photo of his mutilated body and sent it all over the planet. Said America says they believe in freedom and democracy, but this is what they do to black people. That's what forced the Kennedy family and others to start talking about civil rights. Let's not forget that Henry Winston and William L. Patterson, Claudia Jones, they organized something called the Civil Rights Congress. Long before Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was marching in Montgomery, Alabama, and the Soviet Union gave them a platform at the United Nations. And before the entire world, they read a document into the record of the United Nations, said, we charge genocide and accuse the American government of genocide against black people before the entire world. And our comrades, our comrades, back in those days when it's illegal to be a communist, when they were all being counted by the FBI, they walked door to door every black neighborhood in this country is selling that UN report for 10 cents. And black Americans all over the United States got a copy of this document and learned that while the American government was against them, while they were being lynched and brutalized, there was a country that was on their side that represented one fifth of the earth. And even though communists were the most hated thing, thousands and thousands of black people bought a copy of We Charge Genocide, an official UN document exposing Jim Crow segregation and racism. You can thank Stalin for the civil rights movement. This country has been made so better. much better because of Joseph Stalin. Yeah. 
want to talk a little bit about Stalin the man, who he was. Because, you know, I really appreciate Glover for his work because he digs into the facts. And that, you know, Stalin himself, I mean, obviously we don't in this room think it was the evil caricature he'd been painted as. But also, Grover has admit, it does admit, and I, I think he's right, that the, the propaganda image of Soviet state created was not exactly accurate either. It served a political purpose. Uh, in Simon Sebag Montefiore's biography, Court of the Red Tsar, there's a story where apparently Stalin was walking down the street with his daughter one day. The daughter saw his propaganda poster, looked up at it, and then she looked at, at Stalin. She said, Daddy, are you Stalin? And he said, no, no. He said, that's Stalin, not your father. <laughs> and that was because Stalin understood that the image that was created of him by the Soviet state, it served a purpose. It wasn't evil, it wasn't some evil scheme, but it wasn't exactly accurate either. When we dig into the archives and we learn who Stalin actually was, right? this was a young man from a really small town in Georgia. Uh, his mother apparently had many miscarriages before he was born. She made a promise to God, and God, if we were lucky to have a son, I will make him a priest. And she finally had a son, and so she went around and she raised money from everyone in the little village, in Bori, Georgia, and she raised money and sent her son from this poor village to seminaries. And Stalin studied at seminary school and he learned to read and write. And he was a little bit of a juvenile delinquent, from what we understand. He was getting in trouble. Uh, he was at the, at the school, they had a rule that he could only read religious books, but he went to the nearby town and made a deal with the local bookstore. And he was smuggling books and, and running a book selling ring to all the, the boys in the school. <laughs> and uh, he was a genius organizer. We have it in our head. There's this whole narrative that Stalin usurped everything that Lenin did. I think the other way around. I think Stalin doesn't get enough credit. The term Marxism-Leninism was invented by Stalin, for example. Uh, you know... Trotsky, Lenin, all of them were in exile, writing pamphlets at each other. Lenin had the theoretical magazine Iskra. But Stalin was the editor of Pravda, which was the daily newspaper, it means treat, that was worker correspondence. And the Pravda newspaper was, was workers in their factories writing about their hardship, often under pseudonyms or anonymous letters. And Pravda was distributed everywhere in the big city. And people would read Pravda, and they'd see the problem they had in their factory, the problem that they were facing, other people were facing as well. And Stalin was the editor of this mass newspaper that was read by all kinds of people. And Stalin was a mass organizer. Um, you know, during the 1960s, there was a rock and roll band uh, that was called uh, Country Joe and the Fish. Have anyone ever heard of Country Joe and the Fish? Well... This was a rock and roll band in the 60s, but they had that name uh, because the, the founders of the group, their parents were both in the Communist Party. And Country Joe and the Fish were Stalin and Mao. Because Stalin was Country Joe. He was from the countryside. He was a rural guy who could get along with the people in the countryside. And Mao had said, the masses are the water and the revolutionaries are the fish. So it was Country Joe and the fish. And that points to who Stalin was. He was a people's man. He was an organizer. Uh, you know, Grover... He writes about uh, one of his books. There's a story of uh, when uh, Stalin and a number of Bolshevik leaders were sent into exile. And they're in exile in Siberia. And they send them in the middle of the countryside, this little village. And they're, oh, they're awful. What are we going to do in the middle of nowhere? Stalin and ghosts go over the village. He friends with Siberians. And they elect him president of the hunting club. <laughs> he was a people person. He knew how to organize people. He could talk to people of every walk of life. He was a mass organizing. And then that brings me to, you know, one thing that we frequently hear, which is that, you know, of course, Stalin is anti-American, right? I mean, Stalin against everything that America stands for, everything that Americans believe. Well, there's a great writer from the 1930 named Anna Louise Strong. And she was an American. She led the dental strike in Seattle in 1919. Then she moved to the Soviet Union. And this is what she wrote. She, she wrote, there are others like me. I think most Americans are like me. Psychologists call us motor-minded, which means that we think not in terms of visual or auditory images, nor in the terms of graphs and plans, but in terms of action. Perhaps it is our pioneer life that made us so. It's our journeying into the West. We can neither visualize nor hear nor plan, but only march toward. Perhaps it is the effect on our nervous system of the machine, which we unlike the rest of the world, are known 
are born knowing. Or perhaps it is not American, but primitively human. But she says, Moscow spoke to my brain. I learned so much in Moscow. In Moscow's debates and conflicts, they often perplex me. This wilderness of the North spoke to my heart. These are pioneers of a new kind, building a new world, I exulted. It is with them that I must be until the end of my days. Instead of exotic culture or shrines or ancient palaces, amusing laws and quaint religions, I saw peasant populations essentially similar to the greatest land area of the earth. I began to see the Russian Revolution not only as a pioneer land emerging from chaos, but also the first stage in the awakening and industrialization of Asia. To them, now were coming the railroad and the factory and the industrialized civilization of the West. And she writes in 1935, thousands of Americans were flooding the Soviet Russia in 1929 and thereafter. New Americans of the five-year plan. Some fled from a world a world crisis to Soviet refuge. Others had wished to come for many years and found their opportunity in expanding industry. Most of these Americans had one urge in common, the will of the pioneer to create something new in a wilderness. This lured them on. Whether they fought to, great, to build a great steel mill in Kuznetsk or to make one machine work better in Stalingrad, whether they loved socialism or just dollars, or whether they were Americans to whom... The efficient work of God's own permit is to exist. The motives were oddly mixed in them, but the many men wished to make something that would live and expand in the new country. <laughs> Anna Lee Strong was observing that what America was known for, that pioneer spirit, that go work hard and innovate and build something, in America, during the Great Depression, people were starving on the streets. But that American spirit, that motor-mindedness was alive in the Soviet Union. And a lot of Americans knew that because, if I were to say the phrase, faster than a speeding bullet, faster than a locomotive, able to leap a tall building in a single bound, look up at the sky, it's a bird, it's a plane, it's... Superman. And do you folks know how to say the phrase man of steel in Russian? Stalin. Stalin. <laughs> I, I, there, was, there was a lot of feeling that what the Soviet Union was doing was in line with the American spirit. That obviously the Soviet Union was against Jim Crow segregation, racism, and slavery. It was against American imperialism. But the mindset of the American people, and Stalin himself referred to American efficiency in his speeches. There was another anti American about Saul. There's anti-imperialism, there's anti-slavery, anti-colonialism. That's what Saul is about. But I do have to talk about that Nebraska secret speech. Because I looked over the secret speech. I'm working on a project, Center for Political Innovation, laid out to come out with a new textbook. So I, I went over the secret speech, read the words that Khrushchev gave, I looked over the secret speech and I thought, looks an awful lot to me like Khrushchev invented cancel culture. <laughs> so I look over it. I mean, it's just a tirade against this guy. Stalin did nothing right. I mean, when, you know, when, when the Nazis invaded, he hid under his desk crying. No, it's horrible. And he built this guy. He pulled that guy and all oh, my stuff. Stalin could do nothing right. And, and you look at this secret speech, and a lot of it has been just very thoroughly bumped by Grover and others. And anyone who knows anything about Stalin knows Stalin is not the guy that that speech refers to. That's not who he was. But why did Khrushchev give the secret speech? Well, he gave it because Stalin was a pretty tough act to follow. <laughs> and he wanted to secure his grip on power. And on top of that, he gave it because he wanted to make a deal with the U.S. imperialists, which he eventually did. And during Khrushchev's leadership of the Soviet Union, he tried to make the arrangement that the Soviet Union would hold back the world revolution in exchange for detente, in exchange for the USA BS building the arms race. The Soviet Union would go to people in South Africa, go to people in Asia, go to people in different countries and say, don't pick up the gun, don't fight for your national liberation because America had the atomic bomb that's too dangerous. And he wanted to make that deal. And so in order to make that deal, he had to completely discredit the guy who came before him and send a message not to his own comrades, but to the American imperialists. I'm not like the guy who came before me. That Stalin guy fought you. That Stalin guy challenged you. But I'm nothing like I'm nothing like Stalin. I will throw Stalin under the bus. I will repeat all the lies 
that you said about Stalin. Stalin. It, it was a gesture to the imperialists. It was cowardice. That's what the secret speech was. It was cowardice. of the National Committee of the Communist Party USA when they first read the speech. This is how he described the secret speech and what it meant to the people in the Communist Party who heard it. He said, and this is describing the National Committee meeting where they read out the secret speech. He said, the words of the speech were like bullets. Each of them found its place in the heart of veteran communists. Tears streamed down the faces of men and women who had spent 40 or more years, their whole adult lives, in the movement. And I looked into the face of people who'd been beaten up or jailed with me, and I thought of the hundreds that I had encouraged to join the party, and my head was swimming. You want to talk about a cowardly... You want to talk about a stab in the back. That secret speech. That attack on the great project of the Soviet Union, the people who saved the world from fascism, an attack on the man who had led it for cheap political short-term gain. That will go down in history as one of the most treacherous and evil things that has ever been done. I mean, think about it now, because we have developed a culture, especially in our movement, where you get credit for telling on somebody. You get credit for throwing somebody under the bus. You get credit for tattling on somebody for making a mistake. And this is a recipe Tearing apart organization, tearing apart parties, tearing apart movement. And the ruling class, they saw how effective secret speech is. And you can be sure that the disgusting insanity coming out of social media in our time is very much inspired by what they fought off with the secret speech. And that's why I've been telling people at the Center for Political Innovation, we've been emphasizing out of the movement to the masses. And it's not just out of the movement of the masses, it's off the internet to the man, off Twitter, off Facebook, and to our communities, to the working class, people who are struggling, people who need our support. About time that working class people in Kansas and Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Texas, and Oklahoma got a knock on their door, not to sell them some new project from a multi-level marketing scheme, and not to convert them to being a Jehovah's Witness, but instead to tell them that the problem is capitalism, the problem is imperialism, and we need to move towards socialism. And I agree with Vladimir Lenin that our job is not to try and appease the ineffective pro-imperialist socialist movement. Our job is to go lower and deeper to the real masses. That is what we need to do. Out of the movement to the masses, that has always been the Center for Political Innovation's approach. I do want to just quickly mention Center for Political Innovation. We have dual membership with the Party of Communists, with U.S. Grands of Soviet people. There are members of your group that are members of our group, and, and that's totally fine. And we're actually going to be using your office, your headquarters, up in Vermont for a uh, four-day educational workshop that's happening, uh, April 26th through 29th. And I want to personally invite every single person in this room to join us, right? Uh, I don't, at this point, we've got about 27 people registered. We've got room for at least 60. So I think everyone who wants to come join us in Vermont at your party's headquarters for four days of socialist education, of not just classes, but group bonding activities. We're going to have a talent show, singing. It's going to be fun. I hope you come and join us. You can register on the CPI website. You can see me. Uh, I can connect you to it. We'd love for you to join us for our four-day educational workshop up in Vermont. But I do want to tell just one last story because I told this story before, but years ago, for reasons that I will not get into, I ended up taking geometry in summer school. And I was in summer school taking geometry. And I was taking geometry at the local career center with some other folks who, you know, had been kicked out of regular school for reasons that, uh, you know, you know, the people, I think there was one guy in the class who like brought a knife to school. There was another guy who had had a drug addiction problem. And so it was, it was kind of a, you know, remedial atmosphere. I had my communist books there as a teenager. And I remember uh, there was one guy there who didn't like me. He looks over at me and he says, to me, communists are a bunch of faggots. Communists are a bunch of faggots. And I'm thinking like, my God, I'm already in summer school. I don't want to go to a fist fight here. You know what I'm saying? And then from behind me, this one young man jumps up 
And he says, no, communists are not faggots. My uncle fought in Vietnam. They're badass motherfuckers. Those communists are badass motherfuckers. <laughs> and he started talking about how Kim Jong-un shot people in the face. And he was like, no, communists are badass motherfuckers. Well. Folks, Stalin was a badass motherfucker. Woo! Wasn't he? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'll conclude my remarks on that. Thank you again, Caleb. Sure. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah.